Good morning, Wabash. Speaking today at Pioneer Chapel will be President Scott Feller with his talk titled, Rivals. Dr. Scott Feller is the 17th president of Wabash College and holds the title of Professor of Chemistry. He arrived at Wabash in 1998 as a chemistry professor and over the span of his career has served as department chair, division chair, and for six years as the dean of the college. He is also a nationally recognized researcher and has earned 10 grants from the National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health, and the Food and Drug Administration. Elected by the Board of Trustees at the onset of the pandemic, President Feller has proven again and again that he is unflappable and undaunted in the face of, uh, in the face of uncertainty. And he is able to keep his focus on the best interests of our students, faculty, and staff, all while making a commitment to students traditionally underserved by higher education. He's a graduate of Willamette University in Oregon and earned his PhD in physical chemistry from the University of California at Davis. Scott and his wife, Wendy, have two grown children, Amanda and Jake, and they own a farm in rural Montgomery County. Let's give a warm welcome to President Feller. Good morning, Wabash. I want to thank the Sphinx Club for inviting me to give this week's talk. This is only my second chapel talk as president. It's actually the first one I've given from this stage. The other chapel talk I gave, the seniors may recall, was in the fall of 2020. It was out there on the mall. 2020 was a rough year. Uh, for me, at least, I'd say the, the good memories are, are few. The few that I do have revolve around times when individual students, faculty, and staff rose above the difficult conditions of the moment to lead effectively and to live humanely. Some years ago, I accompanied Professor Derek Nelson on a trip to South Africa. It was part of the Wabash Pastoral Leadership Program. It's essentially an immersion trip for a dozen or so early career pastors who were participating in the program. It was also one of the most memorable weeks of my life. The experiences were so intense, it was easy to have a kind of sensory overload. I'm being toured around Robben Island with uh, one of Nelson Mandela's cellmates. I'm at a birthday celebration for Desmond Tutu one morning. I hope some of your immersion trips have had these kinds of intensity to the experiences. But one of Dr. Nelson's most important lessons to us was to remind us early on and often that we don't learn from our experiences nearly as much as we learn from our reflections of those experiences. And that may be why my 2020 memories are so vague. They're about individuals or small groups. What the pandemic stole from us were the communal experiences, those things we experienced together, things we could talk about in the following weeks, things on which we could reflect with others, that we could discuss and debate and ultimately store in our individual and collective consciousness. And in the years since the pandemic, I've come to better appreciate the value of communal experiences. And that's also perhaps because it feels like we live in the era of the individual. Few of us, fewer of us are married or have romantic partners. We have fewer friends. Participation in churches and other civic organizations is on the decline. Now, researchers identify this as a, as a long-term trend. It began before the pandemic. It's continued after the pandemic. But I think that the rapid onset and the sustained isolation from COVID-19 jolted me into an awareness of the value of community. That's one of the reasons that I made the construction of a true community center for Wabash our college's highest priority. 
So I want to share my thoughts today about community. Uh, the, first, the first is about the Monon Bell game. Certainly one of our signature communal events on this campus and one that we also missed in 2020. It tends to be right up there with ringing in, commencement, comprehensive exams on my list of the top communal experiences at this good place. Now, before I dive in, let me be clear. You, you are welcomed to you disagree with anything or everything I have to say this morning. I will ask that you don't reject it reflexively. Don't dismiss my ideas because they don't fit your prior assumptions or because, you know, you don't like me or the administration, don't like people from Oregon, uh, I don't know, don't like sheep farmers, whatever. But if you'll listen and think critically and reflect on my message, ideally communally with others, and you decide I'm wrong, I'm totally cool with that. In fact, if you want to get a cup of coffee sometime to tell me why I'm wrong, that would be even better. So I want to talk about rivalry. And I started thinking about this after our second football game of last fall. Uh, we played the Bulldogs over at the Butler Bowl on a really beautiful Saturday evening. The Wabash Club of Indianapolis organized a nice tailgating event that brought together many hundreds of Wabash students, alumni and their families, and friends of the college. And the game attracted even more. I would guess there were three or 4,000 Wabash fans based on the stated attendance, which exceeded 6,000 people, and my estimate that two-thirds of the stadium was wearing red. Wendy and I took Gus, our six-year-old grandson. I was able to see and meet current students, my former students, and alumni who graduated more than 50 years ago, back when Wabash and Butler were fierce rivals. And more importantly, I met their spouses, their partners, their children. I met their parents, their neighbors, their friends from work. The Wabash Nation turned out to cheer for the little giants, to be sure, but also to share in fellowship and brotherhood and to show the people who are important to them what Wabash is all about. I saw a lot of Wabash red before, during, and after that game, but I also saw a lot of mixing with Butler Blue. There were families who had members that attended both schools, Wabash dads and their Butler daughters, current students with friends at Butler, and alums with coworkers who are Butler grads. It was a great evening. Wabash was loud and enthusiastic in supporting our team. There was a moment in the third quarter when you could literally see the fear in the eyes of the Butler fans as it felt like a Wabash Always Fights comeback was in the works. Now, ultimately, that wasn't in the cards, but it didn't matter. We were proud of our team, and we showed our absolute best selves. The latter was clear to me the next week when we received feedback from the Butler's security and cleaning crews on how much they appreciated our fans' behavior. Now, all of this is supposed to make a college president happy. And while I was experiencing the game, I was ecstatic because of all these good things I just told you. But as the days went by and I reflected on what I witnessed, my feelings actually changed. I felt bad because our experience at Butler made me confront for the first time what we're missing out on at the Monon Bell game. When we play DePaul, we separate families and we separate friends and we never show our best selves and neither does DePaul. We end up strangely taking pride each year in which school behaves less badly. Now each year, one of the teams wins a football game but I fear that each year, both institutions are losing 
because we're missing out on an opportunity to showcase two exceptional institutions of higher education. I fully realize I may have just lost my audience by saying something positive about DePaul. And that's the root of our problem. We have lost the ability to see them as rivals, as good and worthy competitors who push us to be better. Instead, we use rhetoric that frames DePaul as our enemy. And let me be clear, they do exactly the same thing. It definitely happens for a week every November, and I worry we let it happen too many other times throughout the year. We need to reflect on the differences between rivals and enemies. Why do we need to tear them down rather than build ourselves up? Why do we use terms like evil to describe people who are, in fact, our friends? Why can't we even acknowledge that they are our friends? Those of you who are from Indiana probably have a friend or two at DePaul. Most faculty and staff have a friend there. DePaul President Lori White is my friend. Shifting from rivals to enemies just changes our language in such unhelpful ways. We talk, about, we talk in ways that emphasize difference over commonality. We use languages like hate and enemy and destroy. It feels like it's more important that they lose than we win. Reflect on that for a minute. It's more important that they lose than we win. Not only do we use language that emphasize difference over commonality, but for the last 25 years, we've literally separated our schools on game day. We use red tickets and yellow tickets. We fence off the north and south sides of the stadium. Those fences amplify the divide. I fear they perhaps send an unintended message that we expect the worst behavior from each other. Now, I don't like it when people bring me problems without bringing potential solutions, but I admit, I, I don't yet see the path to get from the current Moan on Bell environment to something closer to our Butler experience. I do think it begins with language, and I fully admit it will be tough. I realize I must reprogram my own language knowing how easy it is to casually slip into patterns that I have developed over the past 26 years. Ultimately, our two campus communities must decide that we're ready for change. I generally shy away from top-down solutions, and this problem in particular seems ill-suited for presidential decrees, so you won't hear one from me. There needs to be a will to change, both from students and alumni, from both Wabash and DePaul. My challenge to those who would like to see this change is to think creatively about what our first steps might look like. They can and perhaps need to be small steps to get started. I would love to hear your thoughts about small steps we could take to get a little better and to repeat that, and to repeat that, and to repeat that, and get to a place where there aren't any fences in the Little Giant Stadium or in Blackstock Stadium. I've heard from alumni at both schools who would like to see us move back to a spirit of rivalry based on admiration and respect. And President White and I have been discussing a joint alumni event the week of the Monon Bell game that could potentially give us a start. But the bottom line is, I need your help for us to make progress. And I would invite anyone to give Bev a call over in my office. I'll happily buy a cup of coffee for anybody who wants to talk about ideas and solutions. So as I mentioned, I, I've been around the Monon Bell rivalry for almost half my life. I've seen it grow less and more intense over the years. I also want to say that I believe that our current situation, 
which I might describe as all hate and no respect, is not unique to Wabash and DePaul. I fear, in fact, it reflects broader attitudes in our country. So I want to shift gears now to talk about another contest in early November, the 2024 presidential election. It seems to me our political parties and our candidates have also moved from rivals to enemies. The inflammatory and derogatory language we use to describe the other party makes belt game chants seem pretty tame by comparison. Everything is framed as negative. Every, any step forward is simultaneously used as a weapon of hate by the other side. I challenge any of you to watch five or ten minutes of Indianapolis newscasts just to see the political commercials right now. You'll quickly see what I'm talking about. You can check out the ads for our gubernatorial candidates and you'll see the majority do nothing but trash an opponent. Rarely do these ads prop up the values of the candidate who's paying for the commercial. Here again, we seem less concerned that our candidate wins than we are that the other candidate loses. It seems that the goal is not to make the country better with my ideas, but to prevent the destruction of the nation by my enemy. We're not talking about ideas, we're talking about people, and we're using really unhelpful language. I actually think we have much more commonalities than the present moment suggests. I think we generally want the same things from our government. Public safety, access to decent paying jobs, health care, affordable housing, some common sense laws, good streets, civic pride. But we spend way too much time arguing about how we can provide these basic needs, and far too little time working together to make them happen for the benefit of all. So this dehumanizing rhetoric dominates both political campaigns and athletic competitions, but I'm afraid it doesn't stop there. It has crept into virtually every aspect of our lives, and I think social media has tended to normalize it. Let me be clear. Dehumanizing rhetoric is not normal. It's toxic. It coarsens our language to the point that insults and slurs come out as second nature with no thought for how those words are received. Think for a moment about what some of us shouted at Wooster's basketball players about them, their coaches, even their girlfriends. These are hardworking young men we don't even know. Do we think those players are really different from Amani Jones, from Sam Comer, from Noah Hoopman? Sadly, this toxic dehumanizing language can take over an entire community writ large. It spreads way too easily. Before we know it, we're using unthinkable language on people who should be our friends and our brothers. I worry this is part of what happened at Beta Psi chapter of Delta Tau Delta a few weeks ago. Every member of this campus community is worthy of, has earned our mutual respect. Choosing to attend or work at Wabash embracing the grind, constantly challenging yourself to be the very best version of your authentic self. We share these things in common, every single one of us. If it's true that we are one Wabash two or three times a year for these powerful communal events, then it must be true that we are one Wabash every day of the year. Yes, there are differences between us. Yes, yet those differences are trivial compared with what we share in common. A love of learning, a desire for excellence, and shared brotherhood and lifelong relationships that are at the heart, the very essence of our college. 
When we sling around derogatory terms in a locker room, spray paint homophobic words on a fraternity chapter house, or question in any way a person's worth, we violate the letter and spirit of the gentleman's rule that defines us. We chip away at the foundation of community that holds this good place together. And we fail to live out our mission of our college, to think critically, act responsibly, lead effectively, and live humanely. When I ring out the class of 2024 in a little over a month, my thoughts will focus on whether we have fulfilled the promise we articulated on a hot August day four years ago. Did our graduates receive a world-class liberal arts education? Did they learn to judge ideas and not people? Did they live by the gentleman's rule? And in my closing words to our graduates that day, there will be a charge. I will call on them to leave the college and go out and be good Wabash men. If what I said is true, that the current culture of all hate and no respect is a national problem, then why can't a small band of liberally educated young men provide a new path? Why can't we embrace and live out our values each and every day, no matter the athletic or political opponent or the perceived differences between us? The title of this talk is Rivals, so to close, I'll give one of Merriam-Webster's definition of the transitive verb. Quote, to possess qualities or aptitudes that approach or equal those of another. As we leave this chapel today, I hope you'll reflect on the word rivalry. Shift your thinking from hatred of others to the idea that our rivals possess qualities and aptitudes that approach or equal our own. It won't be easy, but I assure you that it will be worth it. I'd suggest maybe we could get started with some little steps. Reflect on these remarks. As I said, schedule some time to grab a cup of coffee and think about it. More importantly, discuss with your teammates, your classmates, your roommates, your ideas about how to reduce hate and lift up mutual respect for our rivals. Talk in your classrooms and living units about your hopes for a fall election season when we cheer on our, our candidates with healthy respect for our rivals. And together, let's all of us imagine a vision for Wabash where every member of our community is respected and valued a place where every person feels like they belong, where we are truly one Wabash. Thank you. <laughs>